Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first membership meeting since May. And I want to welcome, we have a nice crowd tonight. We have a great speaker late, later on. Um, I want to tell you, I was talking to the staff, Nikolai down here in front, and uh, we're testing out a new capability so that we can webcast the uh, membership meetings. And so for those of, that can't make the meeting, they can actually get it on their phone or at their desk. And, uh, and so we can be live across the industry. So I'm really excited about that. I, uh, Maria wrote and I were talking and we feel that multimedia and technology is really important to this organization moving forward. So with that, I'm uh, really glad to hear that. Um, Harrison Smith was gonna join me on stage. He looks like he's running a little bit late, so I'll just proceed. Um, I think if everybody knows Harrison, he's uh, at the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. He's also the Executive Vice President of ACT. And he was standing in for Maria Rote, who's the ACT President, because she's on travel today. So um, we'll have to check in with Harrison when he gets here. Uh, first off, let me say it's been a really busy summer. There's a lot going on at ACT IAC right now. I see a lot of people in the audience here that have volunteered in many capacities to support this organization. And the first thing I want to say is thank you. This organization does not exist without the volunteers and the people that work on projects, help on planning committees, and you're the, you're the, um, the gasoline that makes this engine run. So I can't say enough thanks to all of you um, some of you have really, it's almost like a second job. I'm looking at Tim Smith right now uh, with ELC, but um, for many of us that's true. Um, so first of all, I just want to talk about our agenda tonight. Uh, we do have a few remarks from me, and then we're going to move into um, uh, some, a bylaws working group session that Richard Spiles will lead. Then we're going to talk about Federal Insights Exchange. Anne-Marie Johnson is going to present on that topic. Uh, the 2019 Imagination ELC Conference. We have Tim Smith sitting right behind Anne-Marie there. Uh, and then we have our guest speaker. Bill. And Bill. Oh, sorry, Bill. They're, they're inseparable, so Tim and Bill. The Siamese twins. Um, and uh, so we got a, a real packed show here tonight. And then, of course, we have the reception afterwards. Uh, Harrison, come on up. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry for my delay, as, uh, as many of you are, are well aware and familiar. This is, uh, this is the throes of the fourth quarter. Uh, but this is obviously an important conversation, an important meeting, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to note. Uh, Maria uh, wrote, uh, who is the uh, executive president, she unfortunately was able to join us today. She is on travel, uh, but she did want to express, again, her appreciation for uh, an active event and participation. Um, if you have not already uh, taken the opportunity to register, not only for, for ELC, uh, as I have, I'll certainly be there, as will several members of the Treasury and IRS teams. Uh, I really recommend that you do so, but also take advantage of some of the events, uh, both immediately before uh, and uh, just after uh, the standard quote unquote panel conversations and learning events, which are obviously going to be great. Um, but I, I personally am taking advantage, advantage of uh, the golf outing uh, on Sunday, so, so I'll be there if any of you uh, will be joining us in a, uh, a cost and uh, mind consuming pastime such as golf. Uh, but please do take a look at those. Uh, those additional offerings uh, at ELC. Um, the only thing that I would, would like to note um, is that uh, as we move forward uh, towards ELC, uh, there's a lot of great momentum, a lot of great conversations that are gonna come out at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, please continue that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to many of the panels uh, and many of the conversations and look forward to seeing you there as well. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Harrison. So we just finished up with the agenda, and uh, first thing I want to do is I want to welcome our new executive committee uh, members uh, from the IAC side. So as I call your name, please stand. Alan Ashby from Unisys. Kavita. <laughs> Kavita Kalator, is she here? I hadn't seen her. Okay, from Net Impact Strategies. Stephanie Mango from CGI. Okay. Daryl Peak. I know he's here. There he is. And Cheryl Waldrop from GDIT. Uh, the, the, uh, the other person from, if you could remain standing for just a minute, all of you, thank you. 
Uh, the other person is our executive vice chair, Tony Scott of Tony Scott Group, and he's not here tonight. Um, and then I'd like any other members of the executive committee to please stand. Anybody else? Do we have Kathy or, okay, there's Richard. All right, any others? Oh, there's Kim back there. Very good, Kim Pack. So if any of you members want to learn about what's going on or if you have questions or maybe you want to discuss better ways of doing things, these are the people to talk to, okay? So, uh, so I welcome, we welcome all your comments. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Uh, on, on that note, I do have actually a very important and more serious matter to discuss. Um, unfortunately, um, Tony Scott, uh, our executive vice chair, has resigned for personal and family reasons. And so um, we're sort of in a funny place. This hasn't happened before at act -IAC, and um, you know we're challenged by that fact. So just so all the members know, uh, it, it's our, the uh, bylaws for IAC had anticipated if this ever happened, and so there's actually provisions in there. And um, what it says is, let me, maybe I should just read what it says. Um, <clears throat> It says in Article 5, Section 5, Page 5, in the event of a vacancy in any office because of death, resignation, removal, disqualification, or otherwise, the IAC chair may appoint a replacement subject to the approval of the executive committee for the unexpired portion of the term. In the case of the EVC, they're, they're supposed to be the chair following me uh, after my term is up this coming summer, and then they become a past chair like Richard is uh, today because he was the chair previous. So it's a little different situation, and I just want to make sure we're real clear and that we're communicating to all of you. Most of the at-large uh, executive committee members are serve a two-year uh, term, and in this case, it's a three-year term. Uh, so again, the bylaws say that there's an appointment that's approved by the EC, and then we moved on. So we haven't, we're still going through the process at the executive committee, and as soon as we reach a consensus on that, we're going to um, make sure that we inform all the members of act IAC about the result of that, okay? So that, I know that's important to you, um, because that's gonna be the leader next year following me, and uh, we'll be sure to communicate that as soon as it's done. So um, I don't know if anybody, I did, I did wanna mention one other thing. Actually, Tony said in his letter of resignation, he said, I remain an enthusiastic supporter of act IAC and its mission, and wish you and the whole act IAC team great success. So Tony's still very passionate about the organization. Um, you know, it's, it's regrettable that, uh, this, that, that he's got these personal and family issues to take care of, and um, so we wish Tony well in his endeavor, and um, you know, um, these things happen. Moving on, so on a, on a brighter note, we do have some new members, new member companies. Whoops. And uh, so I'd like to recognize the companies that are new members of act IAC. If you're in the audience today, can you please stand? All right, good. Okay. Uh, you know, we're, we're, on the, we're on the order of about 400 member companies today on the industry side, and so we're, we're very strong today, and it's always great to welcome new members. And it's interesting because sometimes with new members you see old faces, and uh, there's, a, there's a few out there that have been around this organization for a long time. So again, thank you so much for, for signing up and being a part of what we do here. Okay, so uh, in case you hadn't heard, there's upcoming events. And I'll just highlight a few of these. Uh, most importantly, uh, we have the uh, GSA Multiple Awards Schedule Director, Stephanie Shute, on the 9th. So that should be a really good show if you're um, able to attend that. We also have the uh, October 16th Networks and Telecom is doing their uh, Community of Interest monthly meeting. And uh, they're featuring Dr. Suk Wu Ri. Associate Director of Cyber and Physical Systems Programs at NIST. So uh, that should be a good show. Of course, the next one is, um, the, or the, the last one on the list here, Imagination ELC 2019. There's been a lot of effort going on. It is gonna be the best show ever. How many people have been to ELC before? 
pretty much everybody. Uh, I think if, if uh, you know, I will be there, uh, and this will probably be my, oh, I don't know, maybe my 19th year at ELC. So uh, as you know, it's a great show, but I will tell you the planning committee, uh, led by Bill and Tim, they'll talk about it a little bit more later, but what a show they have put on. We have a tremendous cast of speakers, a lot of government attendees. It is gonna be something special. Uh, so hang out for that. Uh, the last uh, event, let's see, I don't think it's on the slide, oh, there it is, uh, is the Bots Forum. So how many people have heard of robotic process automation? It's, it's, this is a big deal right now. The government is, uh, is really looking at this as part of the president's management agenda to move from low value to high value work, to have computers do the job that is tedious and and rep uh, repetitive and allow people to then focus their work on more important tasks like analyzing data, making decisions, et cetera. Um, so this forum, I gotta tell you, if you haven't signed up for this, you're missing out. There's already 110 people registered and 100 of them are government. 100 government from many, many agencies. So if you wanna get involved with what's going on in robotic process automation, which again is probably the hottest tamale in uh, government right now, you ought to come to this event. It's gonna be a heck of a show. We have uh, the, the keynote speaker is uh, Gerard uh, Baderick, uh, the CFO at GSA. He's leading the RPA community of practice for the government. They have about 400 government people that are in this community of practice. And uh, I went to industry day a few weeks ago. It's, there's a really a lot going on right now, so I really, uh, I can't say enough about it. Um, it's gonna be a fantastic event. So, at this point, let me just say a couple of other things and I'll turn it over to Richard. Uh, we've had a very busy schedule. The ACT-IAC Executive Committee, we met jointly on September 10th. Uh, we basically approved the uh, work plans for the communities of interest um, and the, what we call the Collaboration Council, which is really all the collaborative activities at ACT-IAC. That includes not only the communities of interest, but also the Small Business Alliance uh, and also the um, Institute for Innovation. How many people were at the Small Business Alliance earlier today right here uh, for HUD? Good, we got quite a few people, that's great. I heard it was a good show, so hopefully you got something out of that. And uh, as you know, the Small Business Alliance runs several of those meetings, um, uh, I think quarterly, and uh, there's usually a very uh, strong speaker at those events as well. Uh, the other thing that we've been up to is uh, really working through the assignment of our strategic plans and our portfolios uh, that are aligned with our strategic plan. And so the executive committee members are working on those portfolio items that are gonna take this organization forward. Um, it includes many, many different aspects uh, that you would expect in a strategic plan. There's, there's uh, items on membership, there's items on collaboration, on ELC, on, um, you know, just a host of subjects that are important to us. And many of those EC members are here and they can talk about specifically what, what they do. The other thing that happened last year under Richard's watch and is continuing this year is we tested out a new mission community of interest and that's the health community of interest, the health COI. Anybody here active in the health COI? Okay, good. Uh, if your company is in the health IT or healthcare business, that's the place to go. It is brand new, it is focused on health and everything to do with it, and it's being led by Todd Pentese. Uh, Todd has been around the health area for as long as I've been in Washington, D.C., and he's a tremendous leader, so I'm really excited about the health COI and the aspects of that. This was our first test to have a mission-oriented community of interest, and um, this year we're actually testing out a new one, which is aligned with public safety and homeland security. So that's the new one we're standing up this year. So stay tuned for more information on that. It's gonna follow the same model that we used for the health community of interest. Uh, with that, I, I guess I encourage you to stay tuned and volunteer. There are many projects you can get involved in. We run on volunteers, we need your help. So uh, get involved and, um, and uh, enjoy. And now I'd like to invite Richard Spires up to the stage. Um, thank you, Paul, and um, you know it's great to have you as the uh, as the new chair. So, uh, and I, I'm very pleased to have served as chair, but I'm also pleased to have turned it over to a very capable man to take my place. Um, so, one of the things when I was chair is that uh, got to know our bylaws. Um, perhaps better than I even expected I would have to. 
Part of that was the fact that we did hire a new CEO in that whole process, but part of it was just that issues came up um, that required us to say, well, I wonder what the bylaws say about that. And as a number of us have studied the bylaws, um, kind of got the idea and really crystallized the idea at our, our offsite that we do of the, of the Act and the IACDC in June, that, you know, it's probably time for a refresh. I mean, they were, there were some updates to the bylaws that were done a couple years ago in very specific areas, but we really haven't in many years taken a whole fresh look at the bylaws. And a lot's going on in, in federal IT, um, and we want to make sure that, you know, we're well prepared to address issues across the landscape in the appropriate way a real combination, as you know, we all talk, always talk about, the collaboration of government and industry. And we want to make sure that we have a, a good set of bylaws that support that. The other thing is that there's best practices in the whole association world. And, and we believe, at least some of us that have been involved with some other associations, believe that maybe there's some areas that we could improve the bylaws. Now, the way this works is, you know, we don't just as an executive committee say, oh, we'd like to change our bylaws, let's just write a new set and, and then we'll just move forward. We actually have to get you engaged, and in fact, it's the members, in this case we're talking about the ILAC bylaws, it's the membership that actually approves any changes to the bylaws. So what we decided to do was, and, and somehow I managed to get myself volunteered to do this, is that we would set up a working group. And I, I did say that I would be happy, Paul asked me to do this, that I would be happy to, to chair this working group. And that we would um, really put together a working group of individuals that know the bylaws well, that have worked with them. And so my thought was, not just m mine alone, but we thought that, hey, getting some past chairs that have different perspectives on this would be good. So we reached across the landscape, and so Mitzi Mead, Ellen Glover, uh, PV, don't, don't ask me to actually pronounce his name, but PV and Ted Davies uh, that are all past IAC chairs would be a great group. And then we also thought, hey, you know, it'd be good to have somebody that's, uh, let's say, newer to the industry, can bring some new thinking to this. So Emily Black, who many of you know Emily, she's our Nexus industry chair this year. And then, of course, um, Dave Winogren, who um, has a lot of perspective on this. He actually worked at another major association in this arena, PSC, and so we thought Dave being part of this would make a lot of sense. Now, again, I want to make sure that everybody understands this is a working group. We're here to come up with recommendations. So how are we going to do that? Uh, we're going to go through a process that will, uh, will include, if you will, First thing we're going to do is we're going to go through a bunch of listening sessions. And Dave has been nice enough to volunteer to really be the one that, that drives these listening sessions. So here you have them listed. You can also find them on the website. Okay? If you have any interest at all in having input to this process, if you, and by the way, you don't have to have studied our bylaws to do this, but if you don't like or you think we can do things better in the way we elect our election process for, for uh, uh, for those, that have, of those of us that are EC members, or if you feel like uh, the way the members are represented or how we go about things um, could be improved, we want to hear from you, okay? Now, these listening sessions are open to everybody. Um, here's the information. As I say, you can get this information um, on the website. You can also email any of us. I mean, there's Dave's uh, Act I Act. If you get the information to any of us, myself, you get the information to Dave, you get it to any one of the uh, ACT IAC staff members that you might know, uh, we'll make sure that we, we include that in, in this process, all right? There's also a link there for where the IAC bylaws, uh, if you want to read them, I think it's nine pages long, so it's not that big of a read, uh, but if you'd like to get a better sense of what they actually say, you can find them on the, on the actual website. So let me, let me just reiterate that the, the process is about trying to improve ourselves. Um, we're going to take all this input. We're going to come up with a set of recommendations. And we're not going to just come up with a set of recommendations about change this section to this. We're going to try to, maybe the most important part is why. Why do we think this would improve the organization over time? Okay? 
Um, and, it, and going through that process, we're going to then bring those bylaws uh, to the IACTC. Um, if they or any parts of them are approved at that level, uh, then we would go out for a full vote, as I mentioned, to the whole membership. We want to move uh, with some alacrity in this process, so we hope to get this done, at least our work as a working group, uh, before Thanksgiving. We'll see if we can manage that. Uh, it depends on how much, you know, how much, if you will, work we or recommendations we end up making and the like, and uh, obviously discussions amongst ourselves to draw to consensus within the working group. But that way we could get, the, we could get these changes or recommendations to the EC in December, where we have a meeting, and if that were to go well, then we would actually probably go out, I'm guessing here, but a vote early next uh, calendar year would be, would be what we would hope to do. Um, so again, I'm saying we want to hear from you uh, as the membership. This is your chance to weigh in on these things. Uh, we want to make this an open and transparent process, however, so that you're going to be able to see our set of recommendations that are approved along with the rationale as to why we think this would improve the organization overall. All right, hopefully that was clear. Any questions for me while I'm up here? Yes, John. Well, I, I, I would say, and I'm not even sure this is a bylaws related question as much as it's a general question. I mean, for, for myself, you know, on the EC and certainly other EC members uh, and, and our new CEO can comment, anything that can help us better serve the government is something we would be interested in, right? So, you know, I would, anything like that that would, would make sense to take under consideration, and, and I think you, great, you did bring up a great example, okay, um, in, in TBM. You know, things, tools, standards, things that could help the government better utilize uh, technology to help its mission is something we would be interested in. That being said, I mean, it's got to fit in the sense we're not a lobbying organization, so we're not there lobbying for those kinds of things on the Hill. Um, and we, as an organization, we need to believe that it adds real value to government, okay? Collectively, we would need to believe that before we would act on something like that. Any other questions for me, though, specific to the bylaws working group and what we're trying to achieve, or? Okay, all right, so thank you very much. I, and uh, at this time, I'm going to hand the podium off to, there we go, okay. So my friend Anne-Marie Johnson is taking the leadership role in something very important uh, of what we're doing here at Act Act, the Federal Insights Exchange, and she'll introduce what that is and then talk about what we're doing, okay? How many of you value substantive engagement between government and industry? I think that was pretty much unanimous. Have I got a deal for you? I'm here to talk about a new program that Mitzi Mead initiated a few years ago. Tristan, Tristan Yancey, Harold Yora came before me. I stand on the shoulders of those giants now as the new lead for this year of Federal Insight Exchange. The purpose of Federal Insight Exchange is to create these substantive programs that drive at the mission and how technology and public service, public solutions, excuse me, professional services can actually deliver on those mission outcomes. So the FIE is bringing a departmental or account view to the work that we're doing here at act -IAC. Under the leadership that I'm bringing and the wonderful team that I have, we have a new goal of working very closely with the communities of interest and in building on successes from prior years 
so that in many of our organizations, we're all familiar with the verticals are the departments and agencies, and the horizontals cut across. And we want to bring the best of the nexus of the verticals and the horizontals together into mission-specific programs that get government people out to talk about their priorities, their aspirations, their challenges, and have a, have a good conversation with industry. We've had tremendous success in using these programs to aggregate questions from industry share them with government, and then all of us get better answers with regards to the opportunities that we're all pursuing. And we're doing it in a way that, op that honors all that's needed in procurement integrity. Where's Harrison? Procurement integrity matters. <laughs> and we're uh, excited to pull together a nice cadre of programs. So I know that several of the FIE leads are here. If I could ask you, if you're involved with FIE as a team member or as a team lead, could you stand up, please? And if you're a lead, you want to give a wave? All right. So we have several active teams right now. Department of Agriculture, is led by Tammy Hartz. Commerce is led by Linda Hedden. Homeland Security by Madeline Bayless. GSA by Deirdre Murray. HHS by Tan Pentazzi. And VA by Alex Lunsford. Uh, we're looking for some additional team leads for some other agencies that aren't yet listed. Would love to find somebody to take a sliver of the big DOD Intel community. Um, we have some very strong team leads here and would encourage you to join the teams. Uh, please find me or any of those that raise their hand or April or Carly and we can happily get you on a team. And now it is my great pleasure, my honor, to introduce the next pair of speakers. The next pair of speakers are strangers to no one here. They are the people who are going to be putting on the next ELC. This, this, is, your, this is your time to come on up. <laughs> I'm trying to stall a little bit. We've talked a little bit about ELC, but now we're gonna hear a little more about the incredible program, Best Ever Show, right, Paul? That's right. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Bill and Tim to talk about ELC. Thanks, Anne Marie. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, Bill and I have been giving this um, presentation quite a few times. Quite a few times. Uh, I feel like I just saw you 24 hours ago. We uh, were talking about ELC. I, th I think less than 24 less than hours 20, ago. As, as Paul said, we're uh, we're um, you know we're tied at the hip. We're tied at the hip. Yeah. So. Anyway, we do have a great uh, ELC going on um, this year. You want to kick off with some sure, of the? Uh, sure, sure. We got some slides here. We do. We have some slides. I, you know, we, we you see in the banner there's this number 40. I just wanted to point out, Paul, you said this is ELC number 19, um, right? So, so you're just under 50% attendance at every ELC that there's, that there's ever been. So that's a, that's a really great thing. So once again, we're in Philadelphia this year. This is our, our second year in Philadelphia. Um, uh, so Tim and I are the vice chairs for the event, uh, but we actually have these phenomenal chairs for the event. The, the industry uh, chair for ELC 2019 is Teresa Carlson uh, from Amazon. And uh, the government chair is uh, Suzette Kent, the federal CIO. Um, I will tell you that as, as we talk about the uh, kind of the event, we've actually been planning since prior to April. Um, in April, we officially kicked off. So for those of you who have attended ELC, just to let you know that this is nearly a year-long activity from the point in time that we end the last ELC to when we start up the next ELC, we go through a series of uh, discussions and lessons learned, what we get from the last one, what can we make better, and then at some point after we're a little bit rested and we forgot all, the, all of the pain and suffering from, from being on the planning committee, we then start up the planning committee again. And so we have been actively planning with a really, 
really, really great group since April of this year. Um, and under the direction of Suzette and Teresa, uh, they really have been providing that vision for us as, as to what we should be focusing on in ELC 2019. Um, our focus is on driving impact, and if you were to talk to Suzette and Teresa, what they would tell you is, as we go through ELC, there's a lot of really fantastic and wonderful things, the collaboration, the ability to, to, to meet and uh, speak with your, with your counterparts across government, and if you're in government and across the, the aisle in terms of industry. Uh, but really what we want to make sure that we do is that as we fill this agenda, Agenda and we put the CLC in place that we're able to find things for everybody to bring back from ELC and on day one when they first come back they have something that they can begin to implement so this idea of driving impact um, and and really what we're looking for as we fill out this agenda and and by the way there's 65 to 75 kind of content blocks across the entire agenda, so a lot of content for, po for folks to, uh, to, to take part in. Um, we want everybody who's attending ELC to be able to go back and on that day one have something that can implement. So driving impact is really a large part of what we're looking to do in, in this year's ELC. I'm not getting how this thing works at all. Thank you. Do you have to point? Yeah. There we go. Okay. There we go. Um, so, you know, on this, a few things, we get the question all the time, why ELC? And for, for those of you all raise your hands, you've, you've been before, um, you know what goes on there. A lot of it is about getting together with, with your colleagues again. That's an important part. Um, I think this year what, what, what uh, Bill and I, following, you know, Suzette and Teresa's leader doing is, is give some more of the content, give some more of the key people that are going to be there. Certainly leadership is important that we're going to have Suzette and Teresa there, but we've got a cadre of people and, and just don't have time to go into everybody, but, you know, a lot of key people that are going to be up on stage. Um, I'm excited. We got uh, Deputy Secretary Kelly speaking to us on Tuesday, uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, she's heavily involved in a lot of the data initiatives, cross government, just, just one of the many people. Um, um, I'm pumped up also, you know, for those of us who grew up in the 80s, we got Vint Cerf on Monday at lunch. If you remember Vint when he was doing work at DARPA, um, Vint and Teresa Carlson will be up there on stage, a little, uh, a little fireside chatter between the two of them. It's probably more of a wine cooler chat or something like that. But, um, you know, uh, Vint will be there. A lot of, we're kicking off Monday morning, and a lot of people, I'm going to forget half of them up there. Margaret uh, Weikert's going to be up Weikert. there. Um, Emily's going to be up Emily there. Murphy. Emily Murphy. Um, I'm forgetting them all yeah, now. Yeah, lots, lots and lots of folks. Lots of key leaderships up there. Folks from city, from Philadelphia city government. Yep. So yeah, really a packed. It's a really powerhouse set of folks from uh, kind of around government. The people who are the decision makers, really driving kind of the agenda in federal government. Yeah, and and Harrison hit on it. We're trying to make this five days of impact. We're hoping to get in there on Saturday. We are going to, and there's a little slide in here that talks about some of the agenda items. We are going to have a reception at McCormick and Schmick's on Saturday night. Sunday, a lot of things going on, um, including golf. We're also going to have some outings, uh, food tours, uh, tours of some of the historical uh, uh, monuments there in Philadelphia. And then we're going to be kicking everything off on Sunday night. Monday and Tuesday is largely our content. Wednesday is the day that we want to encourage everybody. You know, we, we got the feedback, hey, we didn't have enough time to get together with our teams, get together, do some training, those types of things. We are setting up a variety of training on Wednesday. Hope you, as you want to get your people together, your teams, your COIs, whatever it is, use Wednesday for that. Yeah, and for those folks who are, who are parts of COIs, encourage your members of the COIs to attend. And we really have set aside Wednesday, and we have kind of facilities and areas and things that, that uh, folks can use to use that as a gathering place for their COIs and, and other groups. I'll just go to, oh, we forgot the big one. Oh, yeah. So, so again, I said this is year two. For those who attended last year, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a journey from the hotel to that to actual conference facility. You'd kind of go through this set of tunnels and you'd end up on this big marble floor and you'd walk across this floor and you'd take a left and you'd go up an escalator and you go, right? So it was, a, it, was a, it was a big journey. We're a lot closer this time. And, and we actually have a much larger um, a footprint this year than we did last year. What's it's like twice twice yeah, we the size. We were fifty-five thousand last and year, and it's one hundred and thirty-five. I guess so, two and a half times. Yeah. But what's even better this year is is that last year there was a separation between the plenary sessions and where all the content was delivered. This time it's all in one contiguous space. So there's a there's kind of a drop curtain that separates the plenary and, and kind of the the food venue from from the other delivery areas. But last year there really wasn't a lot of seating, so we're actually putting 
other collaborative spaces in and around so that in and between the sessions there's actually places right within the, the, the facility for folks to actually gather and sit. And so uh, we, we really took, again, those lessons learned and tried to make sure that we kind of tweaked and improved on what we did last year. But it's a, it's a really nice setup this year. Yeah, and, you know, aside from the sessions, we're, we're going to have a number of sessions, different, different ways, panel, discussion. Um, you know, everything, TED Talks, all that type of stuff. We're going to have Techno again. We've got 26 companies, I think it is, in Techno this year. They're going to be hitting on areas, uh, healthcare, cyber, modernization, um, a variety of other topics. We've got our partner pavilion also. Yeah. Um, here's the cool thing about the partner pavilion, thanks to our uh, partners over at AWS. It is a two-story partner pavilion. I haven't seen the diagram of this yet, but my, I guess I, I haven't been to an ELC where I've been able to go upstairs as, as part of a, a demo component. So we're going to have a lot of stuff in there. We're obviously gives us the opportunity to expand with 135,000 square feet. We're going to have areas you can go off to do side meetings, areas you can go off and, uh, you know, see uh, little TED Talks off to the side. We're also going to have some big components, including a uh, four by four uh, comms van, is my understanding, <laughs> and a simulator in there. So we're, we're trying to get creative with a lot of little things this year. So it should be pretty cool. Um, there, there's real quick agenda at the glance, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, we're hoping you're going to be there for all five days um, as you can join us. Um, the biggest thing that we are, uh, how can we get your help? Get registered. Uh, the room block runs out this Friday. So uh, rooms go away, or the block goes away. You might be lucky and still get a room, but room block goes away this Friday. Um, you see outside, we have cards out there, $50 off expires on the 27th, so get out there, that's this Friday. Uh, get out there, spread the word, driving impact, and you know, use Wednesday, October 23rd, that last day is a day to get together with your teams and uh, do what you need to do or you're in film. Yeah, so get a, if you want more information, you can go to the ACT IAC website. There's a banner there for ELC 2019. Click on that, you'll see uh, the agenda, you'll see who's, who the, the, the speakers are, yep. uh, a lot of information out there. So uh, really, if you haven't been before, um, I, you know, I think what you'll really are going to find is, is that we really have connected kind of the, the, the things that are driving uh, federal IT, right? So, so whether it's things in and around the federal data strategy or cybersecurity or a, any of these kind of subject areas that are relevant and pertinent in, in today's federal IT environment, you'll get, you'll get something that's of value to you. So go out to the ACT-IAC website, take a look at the content that's there, and then more importantly, cl click on the registration uh, button. Yep. Tim? I've... Any questions? Yeah, any questions? Uh, are you hoping to have a greater balance of government versus industry this year? Uh, sometimes it's you know, more, a lot more industry and less government. How can we get more government? You know, I think we always. Yeah, we always. I, I, I think getting the word out to to government and letting them know. You know, we always try to get as many governments as we can. I. I don't know how the count's coming out versus last year. I will tell you, I went through the registration. We have 17 different departments and agencies already signed up. So uh, my gut feel is, and I you know, appreciate your opinion, I think we've gone a lot wider within the government of getting different government groups there. Um, I don't know about the count, but you know we are trying that. Some people from our outreach group, I know Ellen's here, um, have been actively going out there and meeting with government uh, agencies and just letting them know um, you know all about the all about it and you know what we're waiting for now as we wait every year is just for them to get hopefully knock on wood get approval and, and John we do track to that number that that ratio and, and and generally we're sitting somewhere in that neighborhood of about 60 40 right and and so it we're always it, it, as you said um, always encouraging our, our federal government counterparts to to attend as they get a lot of value and um, try to do a lot of outreach to some of the agencies who have not traditionally attended so it's a great opportunity So actually, that's a great point. I, John John Lee is our is our, our communications media guy. John has John has actually generated a lot of content. That content is is kind of out there on the website, but it's also out there in, in other social media platforms. So one of the things that everyone here can do is is that as you see these these uh, kind of content blocks that are out there 
push them out, push them out widely, get them onto your distribution list so that we raise that awareness and we get people in there registering. So, so thanks for that mention, John. You know, one other thing to call out, uh, I know Vera's in the room here. I don't know if any of other themes and thread le uh, leads are Vera Ashworth. They've been working hard as well as the center stage people to get sessions that have government participation. I, I don't know an exact number, but I want to say the majority of our sessions have government participation in them also. So, so they, 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 yes. Anyway. We're probably going to eat the yank here certainly. <laughs> All right. Thanks. I want to say the ELC team is rocking it. Never has there been a more important time to be involved in this great organization. There are more people, more projects, more organizations, more opportunities to collaborate than perhaps ever in the 40-year history of this great organization. And so there's no reason not to be involved in ACT-IAC. And 13,000 of your teammates from government and industry are plugged in and making a difference and recognize this is the go-to place for collaboration between government and industry to get more effective government mission results. I'm Dave Wondergren, your CEO, for those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet yet. And of course I love this place, but I know that you love this place too. And I just want to tell you there's just so much going on. We have only tipped the tip of the iceberg today. Everything from AI to zero trust, data, digital, financial management, workforce of the future, acquisition, it is like mind-blowing how many different things there are going on. And so we won't get a chance to cover them all today, but we will cover more of them as we go forward. We have another membership meeting coming up in November, on November 20th. Put it on your calendar, invite your friends, and as part of that calendar of events, we'll go through some of the more, uh, some more of the activities that are going on in this great organization. I know you want to be involved. There's just nothing like the power of working together to pick up the brush and help paint the future. And so uh, be involved. If you're not involved yet, take a look around. There are I ACT IAC staff members surrounding you in the room, eager to get you involved in the organization. And so if you haven't plugged in yet, you're missing out, come see us and we'll help find a place that fits best your needs, your passions, and where your energies lie. In the meantime, it's my honor to introduce to you today our guest speaker. We had initially invited Essie Miller to come and join us from the Department of Defense. Essie had a personal family emergency that took her out of town and she was unable to get back, but she came through in the clinch for us and rallied a fabulous speaker for us in her, in her stead. She's invited her deputy, and I want to tell you, you're going to be delighted to hear from him. It is his first time ever on the ACT IAC stage, so I know you're going to join me in giving him a warm welcome. Peter Ranks is the Department of Defense Deputy CIO for the Information Enterprise. Pete's had a long and distinguished career. He's a senior intelligence service officer, a uh, longtime CIA officer involved in science and technology, involved in the IC's cloud efforts. He is smack dab in the middle of all of the big tech issues that we're focused on today. So without further ado, would you join me in welcoming Pete Ranks? All right, how's the mic? Good? All right, uh, thanks, it's nice to see everyone. Uh, I am Pete Ranks, that's me. Um, and I am the backup quarterback. Uh, Ms. Miller uh, intended to be here today, uh, our principal deputy CIO, and uh, she regrets that she can't be here, um, but she told me to buckle on my helmet and uh, see if I could uh, uh, talk about our modernization strategy here today. So um, I appreciate the invitation and the chance for the backup to see the field a little bit. Um, but it's important that you know that most backup quarterbacks are on the bench for a reason, um, <laughs> right? In, in, in my case, I'm on the bench for two reasons. Uh, the first is that I don't know what I'm talking about, and the second is that I'm not good at talking. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about because I've only been in this job and only been with the Department of Defense for about five, five and a half months. I came out of the uh, Intel community. Uh, and DOD is very much a, a foreign nation, um, and I'm still trying to, to figure out uh, what it is my job means. That job title is confusing to me, just like it is to you. Um, uh, and the second is, uh, the reason I'm not good at talking is because I came out of the intel community, and the CIA is good at training you for lots of things. One of the things they don't train you for is speaking publicly, uh, or joining organizations, or handing out business cards, or any of that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> Um, so I'll thank you in advance for your forbearance. Um, I hope I've managed your expectations appropriately. Um, I think I got a gadget. Is 
there's only 12 buttons on here, one of them's gonna work. Um, okay, uh, so the vague instructions I had were to talk about DOD's priorities. Um, and what I have brought is DOD's digital modernization approach. And I think my intent is I'm gonna go over that at a very high level. That covers everything that DOD CIO is focused on as a matter of priority. And then I'm gonna circle back and dive deeper on software because I think it's, I think it's misnamed in the strategy. I think it's underrepresented in terms of its value and the scale of the problem. Um, and I know more about it than the other stuff. So we're gonna, um, so we'll spend a little bit more time on that, but I'm happy to take questions about anything that's, uh, that's in here. Um, I might have gone the wrong way. There we go. Uh, so this is, this is the digital monitoring strategy that we use. Uh, a couple of things about this is over on the left, uh, those three bullets, lethality, partnerships, and reform, that is the three pillars of the national defense strategy. Everything that we do in the Department of Defense uh, from the last secretary to this one is anchored in the strategy and our approach to digital modernization uh, is anchored there as well. At the center of that strategy is the warfighter. Everything that we do needs to be tailored uh, to enhance the capabilities of our, of our warfighter. What's missing on this slide is the strategic context for all of this, right? Not only are we tailoring to the defense strategy and trying to build for the warfighter, uh, we also operate in a strategic context where the department needs to shift from more than a decade of counterterrorism as a primary focus back to one of great power competition. There are lots of uh, decisions and trades that we made over the past 10 to 15 years uh, that we now have to, we have that technical debt is due. And you'll see that when I talk through the, uh, the strategy and the areas of priority. Right at the center of that strategy is cloud, is the foundation. Uh, that's infrastructure that we need to build almost everything else on. Uh, we're gonna spend a little bit more time on that uh, and why I think it's, it's slightly misnamed here. Um, on top of that is really what we think is the game-changing warfighting capability uh, in, in AI. Um, this isn't new to anybody in the room. Obviously, the buzzword uh, of AI is on everybody's lips, uh, but there is a very structured approach the uh, department has taken to try and corral a thousand different threads of investigation and AI and make it into a strategy that can deliver results into the battlefield, into our supply chain that can affect readiness, that can improve business outcomes, <laughs> can save us money. Uh, yeah, I could use that. Thank you. Go full Rubio. So AI is what's gonna sit on top of the cloud and we think that's a game-changing capability. Uh, C3 includes a lot of the network access and how we get to all this stuff. There is a bunch in C3 that would be familiar to any CIO. It's how we tie all of our systems together. There's a bunch in C3 that is unique to the Department of Defense, things that we have to worry about that thankfully most others uh, don't. Um, this is an area where we have made choices over the past decade uh, that we need to deal with now. <clears throat> and surrounding all of that is a focus on cyber, an enduring focus on, uh, on cyber, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the other thing that's not on the chart, but I will go to today, is the third pillar of the NDS is reform. And there is a companion, we own a piece of that reform, right? There are many avenues of reform within the department. The IT reform bucket is firmly within the CIO. In fact, it fits it's in, in within my space. In order to do all of this other stuff, we have to create space, we have to create breathing room, uh, and reform is an important tenant to do that. Within the department, reform mostly means uh, getting organizations that wanna do their own thing to do a joint thing. Uh, and to surrender some control and to play into that. So that is a, uh, it's, a, it's a constant struggle in order to do that within the department. Um, so we'll see if I figured out the buttons here. We're gonna go with yes. So I'm gonna come back to this one so I won't talk a little bit, I won't talk much about it now, um, and we'll circle back, except that uh, cloud really is foundational. As I go through the next slides, you'll see a little picture of a cloud uh, on every one of them. Um, the mistake we've made is thinking that cloud is enough in terms of enabling capability. Cloud here in, within the strategy is intended to be the enabling capability that makes the rest of this stuff happen. But just talking about it as cloud uh, reduces the complexity and the magnitude of that problem. So we'll come back and talk a little bit more about that. Um, next up is, uh, is AI. Again, uh, there are, is lots of AI in the Department of Defense. Certainly the CIO doesn't own all of it. In fact, we don't even own the majority of the budget because the majority of the budget for AI is in research. Uh, but the CIO has a couple of key responsibilities around AI. 
Uh, the first is to be a center of excellence, is to bring some governance and some awareness of all the different projects that are happening within the AI space. A lot of that is across the top of this chart. It's where we build partnerships, it's where we build policy, it's where we have expertise on things like AI ethics, the ethics uh, of autonomy, uh, are the things that we need to, uh, to work through. The second is, uh, at the bottom of this chart, is the tooling and the foundational set of capabilities that anybody who's doing AI work uh, is going to feel. And again, you see the little cloud there as an enabler for that, but that's not all that's required. There is a whole pipeline of capabilities that if you're doing AI work, we'd like for people to get started with that and get into their algorithmic development uh, as opposed to reinventing the pipeline. We see a lot of that across the department today where everybody wants to start working on AI, but a lot of the programs are stuck in tool trade-offs and things like that, right? We, we need to get them out of that space and into doing the real work. Um, uh, we stood up a joint artificial intelligence center that's attached to uh, DOD CIO. It's run by Lieutenant General Shanahan. Um, he speaks at everything, so you guys have probably seen him uh, a lot more. Uh, but his organization, in, in addition to being responsible for kind of the policy and governance and these foundational capabilities, is developing a number of what we call national mission initiatives. They are problems within the department that we think AI can advance that are by definition joint things, things that the services will not solve for themselves that cut across lines. And part of the reason behind that effort is to demonstrate that AI is not just a research endeavor at this point, right? The Jake is focused on fielding AI capability uh, not necessarily on solving next generation computer science problems. We need to solve next generation computer science problems, and DARPA and R&E are heavily invested in doing that. But we also have to figure out uh, what happens when these algorithms meet the enemy. Right? What happens when they meet real data and real users and real changing conditions? AI algorithms can be very brittle. Right? You build them around one set of training criteria and minor changes in the real world data uh, cause them to fracture. And that's something that we need to demonstrate. Uh, we also have to get the department used to the idea of the idea and the complexity of fielding AI. Um, AI algorithms go into the field when their accuracy is below 50%, right? And then they iterate. That's not how we deploy weapon systems. Right? We don't roll weapon systems out with a 50% margin of error. The plane crashes half the time, right? <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then hope to iterate. That's just not how the culture of the department is set up. Um, but that is exactly how AI algorithms uh, need to improve. And so there is, uh, there's tension around that within the department. In order to make those big kind of cultural changes, it couldn't be as distributed as it was. And that's why we put the Jake together and stood up the, uh, the AI center. Um, so next to C3, uh, again, there's a lot in here that is common. Uh, there's a few things in here that are unique. Uh, this is an area where the more we move to a cloud-enabled world, where you're going to get your services, whether that's AI algorithms or email, out of a cloud, the integrity of the network becomes more and more important. Uh, if, you, if you can't rely on the network to be there even in uh, contested environments or in times of conflict, then you're kind of locked out of moving things into the cloud where you have to reach across the network in order to, to get into those things. Um, this is a place where in the counterterrorism fight, we're able to make some, cut some corners, right? We weren't as worried about, in the counterterrorism space, people attacking our communications infrastructure <coughs> or compromising our cryptography or any other things that we might have to worry about if we're thinking about uh, Chinese and Russian threat scenarios. It's just a different uh, environment. Uh, and there's been some neglect in this area over the past years, not, eyes, you know, not accidental, it was decisions that were made uh, in order to put money where we needed to, uh, to do things to, to tackle that other fight. Um, but we're turning back to this now. We have an aging communication satellite conversation uh, or, or uh, constellation. Um, also in this space is position navigation and timing. We need next generation GPS and all that stuff to get rolled in. So those are some things that we think about in this CIO's office that you don't tackle in the, in the typical CIO's offices. What's the health of the GPS network and the other stuff? We have to worry about that. We have to worry about comms length that have to exist in a contest, contested, congested, uh, environment where we have near peer adversaries who are hoping to deny this. Uh, it's important that this doesn't get lost in the conversation about cloud and connectivity and everything else, because if we make too many sacrifices here, all that other stuff, uh, all that other stuff fails. 
<clears throat> and then cyber is another environment where uh, we have a lot that is typical and some things that are atypical. Uh, on the left side of this chart, there's a number of things that any CIO in any organization is worried about, right? How do I secure my endpoints? How do I get the right cyber workforce? How do I encrypt my data and make sure that it's protected when it is on somebody else's servers in a, in a, in a cloud environment? <clears throat> we have some unique things that we tackle onto that. First, we have to operate mul across multiple classification levels. Um, there are big barriers today in our ability to move data from one to the other. Uh, second, we have to worry about all the IT that's sitting in those weapon systems, right? There is uh, computing horsepower in almost every deployed system. For years, we decided that because that was off the net, uh, that it wasn't really a threat. Um, and I think we're rethinking those decisions now, but the backlog, the challenge, right, the depth of the hole that we've dug for ourselves is significant. So there is a lot of conversation now about how we tackle this, how we tackle this in a way that is informed by intelligence, how we tackle this in a way that makes sense for where the adversaries uh, might go. Because if you look at the problem in a hole, you can throw up your hands and say, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do. So I think we are more mature over in the left, right? Again, securing endpoints is not different in DOD, except we have more of them than it is any other, right, any other place. Um, DOD CIO doesn't have the only focus on this, right? Every military department has a CIO. There is lots of work that goes into this at every level. Uh, our role is really to coordinate across those things. Um, we need to make sure that from a cyber defense perspective, there's actually visibility and accountability for the work that happens in the, uh, in the military departments, and that's a big focus of the cyber. The numbers on here are actually key to what we call our cyber top 10, which is, a, which is an investment roadmap for uh, how we're investing in, um, in cyber. And the last one was not prominently uh, in, the, uh, in the summary chart, uh, but this is the IT reform piece. Um, we are focused primarily within the fourth estate, which within DOD is all of the other agencies that are not the big military departments. There's like 37 of them, uh, where your DARPAs and your DISAs and your defense health agencies and defense threat reduction agencies and accounting agencies and personnel agencies, all of those things there, they mostly ha all have their own IT. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, redundancy and opportunity uh, in that space. Of course, all of them are slightly unique in their mission, and so it makes moving any kind of common platform a challenge. Um, there's maybe a utopia where we had a common network and a common thing across the entire department, um, but honestly, if we got down to one for each of the military services and one for the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, we would be way ahead of where we are today. So I think our focus right now is in consolidating those smaller pieces and then working with Army, Air Force, and the Navy about how they can consolidate with their own space. So they each have their own uh, reform initiatives. Uh, they are trying to uh, churn money, um, not just back into these other IT priorities, but into lethality and partnerships, the things that are part of the national defense strategy as well. <clears throat> so we own a lot of this. This is uh, focused in the short term uh, on some network consolidation, on uh, some enterprise licensing, trying to leverage the buying power of the department a little bit uh, more effectively, um, on data center optimization, and on moving people to a common suite of collaboration tools. We just awarded a big contract uh, for, uh, for cloud office productivity email and office tools uh, called DOS that is a big part of this, this effort. All right, so now I'm gonna take a big risk and try and go backwards on this slide deck. All right, half an hour in, I figured out the clicker. Um, and I can set it down because I'm gonna stay here for, for a little bit. Um, this is the part of that defense strategy along with reform that is really my quadrant. It's the one that my team is most directly responsible for. Uh, and I wish it wasn't called cloud. Um, <clears throat> cloud is an important part of this, but it lends people to believe that if we, uh, if we can hire a cloud provider, if we can engage uh, a cloud computing company, that we're suddenly gonna get some, some giant set of benefits from those things. And if you look at the left-hand side of this, the sprawl of little bubbles over there are all existing contracts with existing companies. Uh, the department's problem with cloud computing has not been a lack of investment. We already spend about half a billion dollars a year on cloud computing. Uh, we spend that spread across 300 or so different projects. Uh, we're the Department of Defense, which means we have one of everything and more than one of most things. Um, uh, but we have not achieved in a meaningful way any of the real promises of cloud computing. Right? We have bright spots where teams are doing well. 
but they're what I call the two standard deviation teams. They're way out in front of everybody else, right? They represent 1% of the software development efforts. They usually have uh, kind of the best and the brightest. They usually have a burning issue that they're working on. They often have a three-star general that's waving them through all the gates uh, as they move along. We haven't figured out how to take that and feed it back into the rest of the bell curve so that we get meaningful movement across all of the, of the department against those things that are promised to us from cloud computing and the promise of cloud computing that we're most interested in is speed, right? That is the speed to capability for software. We wanna to get tools in warfighters' hands faster is the goal that we're chasing from cloud computing. Other organizations can chase different goals. I wanna shut down data centers. I think I'm gonna save money because because I, I haven't done this before, and, and I don't know that I'm not gonna save any money. Um, I, but there's a number of different benefits from uh, from cloud that people could be chasing, but agility and speed is the one we want without sacrificing cybersecurity. We think the opportunity is there if we change the way we build software, both to get speed and to improve resilience and improve cyber outcomes. Um, and that's what we're chasing, and we have not got it with this unorganized, disconnected collection of things uh, on the left-hand side. So uh, we developed an enterprise cloud strategy which we think could help but the reason I don't like the chart is even if we fully execute that strategy, we're still not gonna get the speed that we're looking for because the cloud infrastructure is just a layer. Uh, and we have to layer on top of that a modernization of the way we develop software in the department, right? We are, uh, we are stuck in a space um, where we build software the way we have built weapon systems. And it causes us to be very slow. Right? And if you picture a pyramid with cloud at the bottom and a DevOps model in the middle, at the top of that I would put data. We have to modernize a lot of our data practices. The other thing that slows us down, if you talk to General Shanahan about what is slowing him down in the development of AI, it is not always the complexity of the algorithms. It is the dirtiness of the data when it comes to him. Right? Even in one of their initiatives, which is, which is aimed at uh, improving um, predictive maintenance for H-60 helicopters. So uh, in the desert, they get... Uh, sand in their machines, as that spins and heats up, it turns into glass, there's a glassing effect, and they end up having to replace the engines because they don't know when that's gonna happen today, they just replace the engines on a schedule, right? And it'd be much more efficient if we could have conditions-based data that was saying, this combination of things has happened, it's likely you're gonna have to replace that engine, now you should do it. I'm not gonna do it just because two years are up, um, but I might do it early if the conditions are being met. But even on that, that's a narrow platform, right? That's not all of predictive maintenance. It's not even all of helicopters. It's just H-60s and it's just their engines. But even on that one, the data that comes off the Marine Corps variant is different than the one that comes off the Army one because we didn't have any data governance when we set that up. Most of the data we produce in our systems today wasn't built to be used outside of the systems that produce it. Uh, and so we have to do the, the work to do that. So cloud at the bottom, DevOps in the middle, or I'll call it modern software development, and data at the top is how we think we get speed in terms of technical enablers. Um, and I still don't think the problem is big enough because all of that stuff uh, lives within a DOD ecosystem that is not wired for that kind of speed in software development, right? Uh, we plan our budgets two years in advance. We do a requirements process where we have to lock down all the requirements through a giant room with all these generals sitting in it and say over the next two years, this is what we're gonna build is, is uh, totally incompatible with an idea where I'm gonna do short sprints, I'm gonna sit down with my users and they're gonna come back and tell me what they, what they want next. We have to figure out how to do that. We won programs in these giant increments where they have to deliver capability at certain times. Again, it's not really well suited to the incremental delivery of small amounts of functionality that I'm gonna iterate on over time, which is how we would get speed, how we would mirror what the industry has done uh, in order to get speed. We have all kinds of hurdles in our acquisition language uh, that make it hard for people to deliver speed on our behalf. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we have the language of deliverables that we use doesn't lend itself to that. We divide our money up into colors of money. Some of it is to be used for research, some of it is to be used for procurement, and some of it is gonna be used for r and for o &M. That doesn't make sense uh, with a piece of software that's gonna evolve over time, right? And it's all geared around the delivery of a weapon system, right? The weapon system comes out and it is done, right? The F-15C is the F-15C until it becomes the F-15E many years later, right? 
We need to be modeled on the Tesla where the car that drove off the lot has a totally different set of capabilities than the one you're driving two years later because the software is continuously updating. Uh, we have a test enterprise that wants things to be locked down before you can test their interoperability with everybody else. Uh, and we have a cybersecurity accreditation platform uh, that again is looking for a, a, a stack of paperwork addressing 800 controls that says you're ready to go and you're gonna test that software before it meets the enemy, before it meets real users and real data and any of that stuff uh, changes. And so um, buying cloud doesn't address all of that, right? There's a lot more that we have to do, uh, both from a technical enabler standpoint I think cloud is a really important point, a part of it. Cloud can help me get speed, especially enterprise cloud can get, help me get speed, right? It can help me get speed to start because if I've got contracts in place, I don't need to be having a conversation about acquisition before I can even start doing work. It can uh, get my speed to experimentation. If I can rent infrastructure rather than buying it, I don't necessarily need to get budgeting two years out in order to start a program. I can start it on a shoestring and then I can let it scale as it, uh, as it delivers value. If I can get the uh, DevOps capability layered on top of modern methodology, it can get me speed to deploying my code. Um, and it gives me a chance, if we can get the accreditation community to learn how to inherit security from the cloud and trust the outcome of DevOps pipelines, to get me speed to accreditation, to get me trust in security. Again, we're not trying to ask people to cut corners to go faster. We're trying to make the argument that you can get better security uh, and move faster. But a lot has to change. Uh, and the CIO doesn't control all of that. Um, if any of you have seen the Defense Innova Innovation Board's uh, software study uh, that came out a while ago, it touches on all these things, right? Um, I had begun drawing something like this on the whiteboard in my office when I first got there, and like three days later I read that study and I stopped drawing because I thought it had a lot of what we needed in it, right? Everything from you got to change the way Congress gives us money and how we describe that all the way through we need uh, acquisition reform. Uh, working with the acquisition folks inside the government, we're trying to carve out a separate acquisition pathway called a software acquisition pathway, right? That, that has built into it the idea that this is something that's gonna iterate over time. Um, that'll have to be battle tested before we know uh, how well it's gonna work, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. There's a rewrite of acquisition policy right now that we're weighing in on to make sure that adoption of some of these principles are there. We have a lot of conversations within the building about how we can get our industrial base to, to adopt this kind of methodology. I'll use little a agile methodology, I just agility. And the conversation I've tried to steer to is, is they don't, it's not a question about how do they learn it, right? They do it for their other customers. And right? if you look at the big defense contractors, uh, there's plenty of space, plenty of, of, comp of uh, customers where they are already good at this, right? We do a lot of business with Boeing. Boeing doesn't build software for them the way they build software for us. Right? They build software for us the way they build it for us uh, because we force them into those boxes. Otherwise. And so we have to have an ongoing uh, conversation with industry about what's the right language to use in order to make sure that they can, uh, they can um, modernize in line with this, uh, with this vision. Um, and even within just the cloud itself, uh, we have to think about all the things that have made adoption slow. I, sp I said we spend half a billion dollars a year um, but that's not nearly where we should be at if we were, a, um, if we were more mature in the, in the evolution towards uh, cloud computing, and it's been stagnant or relatively stagnant for the past couple of years. Um, some of that is because it has just been hard from a process perspective to get projects started in the cloud. Some of it is because it has not been easy uh, to get um, things that are built in the cloud deployed into production because the rest, not the developers, but the rest of the folks in the organization don't have the, the core curriculum, the language, the vocab shared vocabulary around cloud computing down so that they know how to accredit these things. Um, and that is something that lives in the CIO space and we're talking a lot about that now is how do we uh, not just have a policy but how do we have the kind of workforce education in order to do this? How do we not just have a policy but go out and aggressively reform the processes that were built around the old policy? Because um, all the process we have today is somebody's fault, right? It was all born from some policy that probably came from our office when you were there, dude. Right, so it's, <laughs> right, so, yeah, so I think we'll, um, so we have a lot of work to do in, uh, in that space, and I think um, it's good to be able to talk a little bit about it here today because we're gonna need a lot of help in that space, right? The, um, the focus on the cloud section of this chart has been on, on cloud acquisition, on hiring the cloud company, and I think that is 
only a sliver of the problem, right? There is a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, to help us with this larger set of reforms. There's tremendous opportunity to build value in front of and on top of the cloud. It's like any other weapon system. Uh, it's not just about buying the weapon system. We have, to, we have to master that weaponry. We gotta train and equip our folks so that they know how to use these, these tools, whether they're developers or accreditors. Um, and we have to develop doctrine about use. When is the right time to field the right type of cloud within the, uh, within the department? And I think there is lots of opportunity for industry to help us with, uh, um, with all of that. So with that, I'll take any questions that you've got on any of the topics that we put up here. Yep. Go ahead, back there. Yep. Um, have you worked with uh, Nicholas Shalon? Uh, yes, almost, almost too much. <laughs> there. Yeah. So, are, are you are you going to a DevOps question or a? Yeah, let's like say you uh, worked on his uh, white paper. He released a unclassified white paper on uh, architecture of the DevSecOps for DoD. Yep. Is that your group? It is. So that's that paper is actually co-signed by myself, somebody from ANS on the acquisition side, because we're trying to drive in that this is not an IT priority, but also guidance to people delivering software for the department. Um, and a lot of it is built on Nick's work in the Air Force. So the investment in this, in all these technologies, but particularly in the DevOps world, is really in the services. Um, and the CIO is not going to match that investment out of our little OSD pocket. But what we are trying to do is take what Nick has been building in the Air Force. He's now over there as their chief software officer, I think, um, and make that accessible to the rest of the department to make sure the lessons that he's learning and, in fact, the tools he's building, because he's doing a lot of work on uh, DevOps tool pipelines, on container hardening, and a bunch of other stuff, to make sure all that stuff is... Um, is accessible to the rest of the department. <clears throat> so there's two pieces that we put in place and one that's missing. One is we've got this reference architecture out, um, which uh, is, is just out, right? So um, it's good that you've seen it. I, someone asked me for it was the other day and I couldn't even find where it was posted. So, um, but, uh, but that was built in partnership uh, with Nick, with my office, and with uh, the acquisition and sustainment folks. The second is we're trying to build some of the actual logical artifacts. Uh, you know, the, you shouldn't have to just read a document about where to find hardened containers to build these pipelines. You should be able to go retrieve those from a repository. And we're building some of that uh, infrastructure to share across the department. Again, a small amount of money at the department level coupled with a large amount of money in the service to extend what's being done in the service across the rest of the thing. What's missing is a companion document to that architecture that teaches the security accreditation community how to t accept the output of these tools. So again, it's, there's some broken promises here around DevOps, right? Is that it allows us to commit code faster, but it doesn't allow us to get it into production because our security accreditors are still waiting for something to be finished, right? Tell me when it's finished and I'll test it. Well, the code is not finished in this, right? The title of the DibSwap report is software is never done, right? That is the, right, that's the model. So I think we're inching towards, um, uh, towards a, a, a good set of capabilities that we can use to start this conversation. Um, but I, is there a follow-up to that, or was it just? So um, the other follow-up would be, uh, how far have you progressed on like, the um, HEO of the process in DevOps? So like, um, you know, everybody fights to get the ATO, but if you build ATO into the process, it's like certifying the you know, cookie factory instead of making the cookie. So you, you, you certify the process, not each individual part. Yeah, um, so I have a fair amount of conversation with Jack Wilmer, who's one of the other deputy CIOs. He's our deputy CIO for cybersecurity on this. Um, we are committed to the idea of a continuous ATO. Um, but to me, the ATO of the process feels like one of those places where I cut a corner and, and sacrifice security in order to get speed. What I want out of the process is, I want to have the same or better confidence in my system than I do today, and I can get that from inheriting from my infrastructure and continuous visibility from the software development pipeline. So one thing the process does for me is every time I commit code is going to give me a risk rating for that code. Every time I commit code is going to run the vulnerability scanners on it again. That is superior to what we have today, which is we test the ship when it leaves the dock. 
but we don't see it again until its accreditation is expired, right? It has to come back in for a, a refit years later. Um, so we still want to look at individual programs. And this is maybe not where the conversation ends, but it's where the conversation, I think, is today. And we definitely have folks um, in, in the Navy in particular who've come up and said, can we just certify the process? Um, but we need some view, continuous confidence, even if it's just sampling, that the artifacts that process is producing right, haven't drifted from the thing we accredited the first time. And there's some, actually some battle scars on this uh, that, that I saw in the Intel community of years ago, we tried to do like gold images of things. And people would use the gold image to get a jump start in their accreditation. And then as soon as they got it, load all kinds of other crap on top of the, on top of the image. And so we have to make sure that there's some continuous visibility. But what I need, and this is what has to go in that companion document, is my accreditors not to look for a stack of paper at the start, but to go to a dashboard that gives them live view of, of what the security of that uh, program is. And that's just not, uh, that's not where we're at. I mean, a lot of times we have these conversations about upskilling people. We upskill the people who understand it the best, in this case, our development community, and we don't think about the acquisitions folks, the security folks, everybody else who needs to have a basic understanding of it. But thanks for the question. Oh, hi. Uh, John Weiler, ITAC. Uh, as one of DOD's biggest critics of IT, I, I have to say I agree with everything that you've presented today. Um, it's well thought out. The question is, you know, how do you execute? One, one concern I have with what we're seeing in the market today is this uh, Forbes magazine called it Faked Agile. Mm -hmm. I read it. And um, I have to agree, it's, you know, a little bit homegrown here, but more of a concern is focus, it's a make bias process. It's saying every problem is a software development problem. Mm -hmm. And there is a horde of capabilities in the market, not only here, but outside that are inventing and creating, and they just want to plug into your standard infrastructure, whatever you have, you know, some standard API. So maybe there's a way to not make everything make biased because software development's risky, costly, and often fails. Right. And maybe provide the community with standard APIs to your new cloud environment that's cloud agnostic so you can move to different clouds and also everybody knows what that looks like so when they come into a DARPA project or through an OTA, they already have exposure to what that standard API and toolkit is. Right. In fact, I've been speaking with my friend Bill Zielinski about maybe establishing a common set of DevOps toolkits that enable that right. plug and play environment. But it's just a thought. I didn't hear a lot about that, but everything's great here. I hope you can execute on all of it. Yeah. Thank uh, you. No, good comment. And I skipped over a lot of what's actually on this chart and what's intended to convey, right? Um, Part of what's on there is this idea of, within, and this is within a cloud strategy we published at the end of 2018, right? I think it hit the website in January of 2019. This is the graphics enhanced picture from that cloud strategy. Um, and there's a distinction we made there between uh, a general purpose cloud environment, which is kind of buying the Lego blocks that we're going to have to assemble, assemble ourselves, and a fit for purpose cloud environment. And there is actually a bias towards um, if we are trying to solve a problem that is being solved already in industry towards just buying that from a fit for purpose cloud, right? And we have many examples of this. I mean, we just, we, we have, um, we just awarded the big uh, office productivity contract, right? We, we don't need to build those and run those servers ourselves anymore. We can just buy that as a service. We've done similar things uh, for HR. We have one for case management uh, that we actually use in the POW MIA recovery area where we use essentially a SaaS provider in order to manage all those cases and all the interactions that we have with those, uh, with those families. So if there is a good commercial analog for the problem, then we can buy a lot more of that capability and just try and figure out how to fit it into the security paradigm we've got. Um, when we're talking about how to fuse the command and control environments from a lot of the services and bring them together on a, on a common picture, there's a lot of, of middleware, to use a term that isn't used anymore, that we could inherit. But, uh, but, but ultimately what's on the glass is probably something that we, uh, that we need to build. Um, to figure out how to get the intel information across all those cross domains. There's some problems that are still unique in our space. The flight control computer on the F-35 is not something that we're probably just going to uh, right, be able to get from a commercial analog. Uh, there's some work that we have to do. And so we need tooling for those problems to be able to go faster in that environment. But I agree, we need to be very conscious about when we decide that we have to buy the Lego kit and assemble them ourselves versus uh, buy the fully assembled model. We've got one more, we'll let Harrison take us home. Yep. 
Uh, thanks very much for your, for your time and your comments today. Very helpful. Uh, you mentioned a couple times, uh, at least four, I think, uh, the, the delay in the acquisition approach and the time frame. And you also mentioned uh, Boeing, I think, was the example that you gave in terms of they build, build software um, yeah. and applications their own way uh, for other customers, but they are sort of forced into a different approach for the, for the government. If you had to highlight you know, perhaps one or two areas, especially those that you see uh, from your perspective as limiting the offerings that we in the government get from industry um, that's caused by the acquisition and caused by the procurement frame, uh, what would those be? Um, are, are you looking for problems or specific examples of what's been slowed down? Uh, either. I mean, you could say uh, it doesn't allow out your phases to be modular and be based upon what we learned in previous years. Yeah, so, so, there's, a, so there's a lot of that that I think is, um, uh, th that's the, actually the easiest place for me to go is I think these things that are structural, right? And uh, I think the um, requirements process in particular and the way we train acquisition professionals um, does not allow them to take proposals that says, this is what we'll do in the first six months, and then we'll figure it out, right? Uh, based on what we did then, we are going to iterate quickly. And so we need to figure out um, what the right acquisition language is. There is a bunch of training now in Defense Acquisition University to try and get these folks up to speed, um, to try and get them familiar with the terminology. Where it has landed us today is in a lot of that fake agile, um, where what we do now is we... Um, deliver code every two weeks, but then we build up six months of code before we do a release because that's how the project manager is looking to, to do the work or some other part of the process forces us back into that. The one to me, they're all hard problems to solve, but the one to me where the solution is most mysterious is in the operational testing realm, which is something that even in the IC is not something that we really dealt with, right? Is that when your thing is finished, it needs to be tested for its own functionality plus its interoperability with everything else and its survivability kind of in a, in a, in a multi-mode test environment. It takes a long time. Um, and if as soon as you test that, you change it, uh, then you kind of have to go through that whole process again. And I don't really know what the solution is because that testing can really matter, right? The, uh, and it's hard to write unit tests or some other software solution for interoperability across all these, uh, all these systems, right? It's not does the radio work. It's does the radio work in an environment with three levels of ISR and four countries' jets and lots of other interference. Um, that's the operational testing piece of it. And today, um, once that thing is tested, it's not supposed to change a lot. And um, although I would love to be able to be updating the... Um, the software and our weapons platforms right in the middle of a conflict, there is value in the kind of testing that we, uh, that we do there. And I think that is the, for me, is the, is the biggest unsolved problem. I'm not sure it's the biggest problem, but the acquisition problems, I think we have a handle on. It's just a hard job, right? You not only have to write new policy, but you gotta get all these acquisition professionals trained. But the head of the acquisition service agrees we ought to do it. Uh, this whole modernization strategy, the, the big picture one, gets briefed to the Secretary of Defense every, every kind of five to eight weeks, depending on the cadence, and all of the service secretaries um, and their military leadership as well. So there is good attention on it. Uh, the testing problem is one that's kind of unique to the department that um, I, I'm not sure that I know what are the way out of that is just yet. Thanks. So, so I want to say, if you were watching NFL football last weekend, there were a couple of breakout backup quarterbacks last <laughs> weekend. And so I want to say, you may have come yep. into this as the backup, but well done. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. All right. Well, thank you again, Pete. That was awesome. And thank all of you for spending the time here with us. We have a reception coming out immediately as you exit the doors. You are the leaders that have been responsible for 40 years of amazing success for ACT-IAC, and you're going to be the leaders that take us into the next 40 years. We would love to hear from you. If you care about things like the bylaws, check into the listening session or send me an email. But no matter what it is, what a good idea, what path for the future you have, I want to hear from you. Seek me out. We'd love to hear from you. Go have a reception, and thanks again for coming tonight.